Hey everyone, and welcome to the Team Made Apart podcast, the podcast designed to teach those who work remotely and those who hire them how to work better together. I'm your host, Ryan Rogar. Before we get started, as always, today's show is brought to you by TeamMadeApart.com. Team Made Apart features articles, tools, and resources designed to teach remote workers and those who hire them how to work better together. A community for owners, managers, leaders, freelancers, contractors, and all variety of remote worker. Team Made Apart is also a terrific resource for companies interested in implementing remote work policies in otherwise co-located environments, or for those planning to build fully distributed organizations from the jump. Listeners of this podcast have an exciting opportunity to get involved in the remote work revolution. In light of current events related to the coronavirus pandemic and a sudden worldwide shift to remote work, we're offering a free remote work best practices guide for leaders who find themselves struggling to create a remote work policy in a pinch. Now, and for the duration of the crisis, visit teammateapart.com slash crisis to not only download your free Teammate Apart Remote Policy Primer, How to Write Remote Work Policies That Don't Suck, but to find other tools and resources to help you weather the storm. Great working relationships make for great remote work experiences, and with this free guide, you'll be better equipped to do your part in creating and maintaining a happy and sustainable remote life. Once again, to take advantage of this collection of useful resources, please visit teammateapart.com slash crisis. That is teammateapart.com slash crisis to download your free best practices guide. One more thing before we kick off the show. Now and for the foreseeable future, teammateapart.com is offering free support and advice to remote workers and remote leaders alike through Teammate Apart Open Office. From noon to 2 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday, you can visit TeamMadeApart.com and navigate to the bottom left-hand corner of the page where you'll find a chat icon. Simply click it and you'll be connected to a real, remote work expert who is happy to help you solve problems in real time at no charge to you. Of course, you can use the same tool 24-7, 365 to ask questions or request services, but during open office hours, you've got a direct line of communication to people who care and people who can help. Once again, from noon to 2 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday, simply navigate to teammateapart.com, find our chat icon in the bottom left-hand corner of the page, then click for instant support when you need it at no cost to you. Take advantage of this special program while it lasts. And now, back to the show. On this week's show, we have very special guest, Taylor Cashdan. Taylor is a Raleigh, North Carolina-based, multidisciplinary creative, community builder, and stress management expert. He is passionate about people, design, and all the intersections in between, leveraging those tools to fuel a burning need for collaboration and team building. After overcoming a medical emergency brought on by overwork and stress while working remotely, Taylor has become an expert in helping others overcome similar issues all too common among distributed teams and freelance workers. He shares his message of hope and happiness to audiences large and small at conferences, in workshops, and on podcasts. Here to talk about overcoming and working with stress, isolation, and other concerns is our guest, Taylor Cashdan. Hey there, Taylor. Thanks so much for doing the show, man. I'm glad to have reconnected. So for people listening to the show, uh, our guest today, again, uh, as we mentioned at the top, Taylor Cashdan. Taylor, I met a couple years ago at, or or last year, actually, at Creative South, which is coming right up again here pretty quick. Um, And Taylor gave this really amazing talk about stress and anxiety and overcoming, and and I just thought he'd be a perfect guest for this show. So I would love to to start picking your brain, Taylor. So why don't we just kind of kick it off from your backstory? Let's, you know, tell us a little bit about who you are, where you come from, and what you do. Sure. So uh, my name is Taylor, as, as you alluded to. Um, I'm a designer uh, in the traditional sense in that I just am a creator by nature. So the the realm that I play in is a, is a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, professionally, I guess you could say, um, I work full time for a company called Fidelity Investments. I'm a principal UI or UX designer there. Um, but outside of that, I work on brand projects uh, from a freelance perspective. I did a stint of just full time freelancing, doing primarily brand and marketing work. And before that, I was in the traditional marketing realm doing what I guess you can categorize as regular graphic design, you know, like the, the stuff for 
trade shows and, and sell sheets, that kind of stuff. So I've been all over the spectrum. Um, so I kind of identify as just a creator in general uh, at this point. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, yeah. And as I mentioned, one of the reasons that I wanted to have you on is, you know, I, I met you in the context of a creative convention, you know, and my background as well as an art direction, creative direction. And uh, I'm actually a little disappointed in you that you don't have a black t-shirt on. I felt like we'd have, you know, the total art director club thing going. So I assume it's laundry day and I won't take it personal. Well, I have gray locally screen printed. Uh, all right. All right. I'll take that. I'll take that. As long as you've got some like craft coffee or something going on there too. You know, I just want to make sure that we're checking all the boxes. Oh, I do. Custom mug and everything. <laughs> there you go. All right. Perfect. So, um, but anyway, so I met you in the context of creative and, and one of the things I've found is as I've started to dig into this remote working world, you know, and trying to, to problem solve and help people through remote work. Um, I'm, I'm noticing, you know, and it's pretty surface level. I'm not discovering some great insight, but you know, but there are a ton of similarities between people who work in the creative space and freelancing, uh, and the people who are remote workers or working otherwise depart or detached from their, you know, office, they're working from home or wherever, or in some cases internationally. And so I thought that you would be a terrific guest to talk about some of these struggles because, you know, the things that like, uh, isolation and stress and anxiety, things like this you know, are really common in those fields and, uh, you know, among remote workers themselves and freelancers and, and all that stuff. And so I wondered, you know, what is your story and like, how did, how did you get into sort of this space where you start work, you know, start working with people on helping to overcome stress and anxiety? Yeah. So I think to, if we dial back uh, as far as my memory serves, um, I've always been the the kind of person that, that wanted to be over involved in things, whether that was work or play or, or just, I say projects, but that doesn't always mean like making stuff for a client. Like that could just be building things or, or just being spread out uh, from an obligations perspective, right? And I mean that by like socially and personal projects and just general responsibilities, whether it be work or play, school, et cetera. And I was always the type that would just compact the schedule as much as possible. Um, and I thought uh, a few spokes, one was that it was the way it had to be done, right? It was the way that it was supposed to be done because you see all these like, quote unquote, successful people, you know, that are never have a moment of free time kind of thing. Um, two, uh, I thought it was the only way that I could uh, fulfill myself, right? Whether that be socially or creatively or whatever, that if I had all of these things going at the same time, I'd be able to scratch the itch, you know, and never feel that burnout thing or, or boredom or that I was getting behind. So I would just fill the plate. Um, and then third, uh, I think it was also out of a, a desire to, to be involved, right? So if you spread yourself thin, arguably you're as involved as possible, right? When that's, that's the, I'll use this word loosely, an immature approach, right? To, to, uh, to involvement is that when you, when you spread too thin, you know, you start to realize you're not really getting involved. You're just kind of being there. But, um, where that kind of peaked for me, I guess you could say is, uh, I was at a, a job where, um, I was the only creative. And so basically anything that had to be made came to my desk, which was really cool. Um, in one vein, cause it was like that I had, you know, basically full creative control over the direction of the aesthetic of the place. Um, whether that meant like landing pages or sell sheets or, you know, micro brands or presentations, like everything that, that went out, at least from at the top level I touched, which was really awesome. You know, when you're talking about the company was, you know, three, 400 people large. Um, yeah, as a creative guy, that's like dream come true. Yeah, right. But then you start to realize, and th I think there's two spokes to this. So in the context of this podcast, it's isolation, right? I realized that I was the only creative, which meant I was, and I was, I was almost fresh out of college. So I was, thought I had all this knowledge, right? That I was imparting on the way that needed to be done. And then I realized like I began to templatize things, number one for speed, two, because I wasn't being challenged. My ideas weren't being evolved. They were just yeah. like, all right, cool. I was doing this thing that met the needs, right? Or hit the, the baseline thing from a, the, the marketing team's perspective, but not at their discredit, but they weren't challenging me to do more or to go a different direction. And I didn't have anyone to bounce ideas off, right? So that isolation vein created this like, toxic circle of instead, I wasn't getting that fulfillment from the job. So I went outside of the job to get that, right? So I started doing freelance projects where I would have clients that were involved or I'd tag team with, with people. I would get involved with professional organizations, um, event planning, all that kind of thing where I could collaborate with others um, and arguably do some of the similar work I was doing at the day job, but to kind of fill that other side of the need that I realized I wasn't getting. Um, and just craving being more involved directly with creative people in the design sense. There's plenty of creative people out there, but to say like, you know, I needed someone to go move that five pixels to the left. 
not that looks great, you know? Right. And, and it was hard to get that from where I was. So what that basically created was a perfect storm for a stressful environment, right? So I, I had my obligations at the day job, which were sometimes a lot and sometimes, you know, minimal depending on the day or the project. But regardless, it took up the bulk of my my day. Um, then afterwards, I'd be trying to scratch the itch, right? And whatever time I had after work to do that on top of like trying to live a healthy lifestyle and make dinner and maintain a social life and take care of the dog and all the other things that mm. come with life. And I woke, ended up the, I woke up one morning, um, quite literally, uh, drenched in sweat and my chest was pounding and my head was in, you know, all sorts of knots. And I assumed I just slept bad or had like a bad dream or something. And it, and so I got up, I got showered, I, you know, I went to uh, get ready for work and I ultimately just went to the office, right? Cause I, I felt that I felt better after, you know, cleaning up, so to speak and getting ready, figuring this, this wave of whatever these feelings were past. Um, and by the time I got to the office, most of the symptoms, I guess you can call them were gone, right? I didn't have the sweat anymore. The headache had kind of subsided, but I still had this like pitter patter in my chest. Um, and the, the, the abridged version of this story is I ended up going to the hospital after a few, uh, you know, intermediary steps. Um, and when I got there, I was told that I had a resting heart rate of 180 beats a minute. So wow. contextually, the average you know person just kind of like resting could be between is usually between 60 and 90, depending on like if they had coffee or if they're athletically fit or if they have other health factors, but like sure. just sitting still generally around that around that range. Um, so I was literally double and more <laughs> sitting in a hospital bed, right? So I was both winded and full of energy at the same yeah. time, which is a very weird combination of, of feelings. Um, but basically after ruling out all of the, the common causes for this accelerated rate, right? Uh, other health conditions, overweight, diabetes, you know, drugs, all the other things that may have impacted this kind of speed. Um, and trying some remedies to get me back to normal, right? They tried medication. They tried literally shocking me with a, a defibrillator three times. That didn't oh, work. Wow. Um, and I ended up sitting in the hospital bed. And only then, after literally having to take the laptop out of my hands, were they like, you need to just not do anything for a few minutes. Like, you can't <laughs> be run and gun all the time. Like, it was to the point where I felt I had to, like, let my coworkers know I wasn't coming into the office. <laughs> like, I'm in the hospital. Like, I'm not going to be able to finish that project, you know? <laughs> but it's like, Taylor, like, stop. Like you're in a hospital for a reason. Like th this stress is what the doctors ultimately um, pointed it to is what puts you here. Like a lot of it's self-imposed, right. Of thinking I had to do all the things. Um, some of it from the job, right. Of just general pressures of, of having responsibilities for better or for worse. Um, and then the culmination of all those things together. And that's that third portion is often the thing neglected, right. Where we can acknowledge, like I have these responsibilities at the day job or wherever you work, even if it's for yourself, you know, I have to get these things done, right? That's pillar one. And then we separate that from like pillar two of like, I would like to do these things, whether that's social, uh, meaning, meaning social behavior, like with other friends, people, dinners, um, not social media, uh, projects outside of work that just aren't client affiliated. And we, we bucket them, right? And we think, okay, that's just two spokes of work. They're separate. They're never going to interplay. I have to think about them in different ways. You know, I do them at different times, but we don't realize is, your brain doesn't discern the difference, like in your subconscious. It's still work, right? And by, by work, I mean like activation of neurons, right? You're still requiring effort in your system to get these things done. And when that hits a point of like overload, your, your body sometimes, like in my case, will respond in a way that's like, clearly you weren't listening to whatever signals we were telling you before. So here's this really drastic one, right? So yeah. you can learn that this is not okay. And that's kind of where my stress addiction journey kind of began. Well, and it's so funny, to, well, a funny and ironic way to sit and listen to you talk about this stuff, because like, I mean, you know, as somebody, I mean, we're probably of similar age, you know, and, and sort of similar trajectory in terms of the type of work we do and things like that. And, you know, I felt a lot of these feelings too. In my case, I've not yet been hospitalized for it, but I mean, but the things you're talking about trying to, to balance all these different things and all that stuff is, uh, you know, I think you know, indicative of this kind of work. But I think it's also true for the remote worker who's got to sort of cobble, Absolutely. you know, responsibilities. And, you know, I mean, generally speaking with a remote worker, they're being held to really high standards for productivity and things like that, you know, so it's you've got to get your job done. But the whole reason you want to work remote is for some flexibility. And so you've got to balance now you've got to work life in, you know, you used to just be able to go to the mine, you know, and stay there all day. 
but now you've got to, now you've got to go get the kids. You've got to do whatever, you know, I mean, like today is a great example for me because I've got um, my cons- uh, consulting work this morning, I've got podcasting this afternoon. I've got a kid's play later. Then I've got to switch gears and go back to work for a while. Then, I, you know, and it's, but it's all these things. And so to your point, you know, your brain can't tell the difference. Like it's all one thing. And all it knows is it's not being rested. (laughs) And so um, one thing I wanted to kind of point out, though, and I think it's actually something I read from an article you wrote, um, but you were talking about sort of, you know, I guess, acknowledging or understanding that some of this stress was self-imposed. But I wondered if you had any thoughts about sort of responsibility versus fault. So I think, you know, a lot of us feel like it's, you know, this obligation or whatever. We like to fill the space, right? So we're trying to get as many things on our calendar as we can. And ultimately, yeah, it's our fault. Like we're responsible for it or I, I'm actually messing that up. I'm using them both as the same thing. But um, well, you know, well, basically the idea is that, you know, we, we need to take some responsibility or ownership in the case. Sure. But, you know, we, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll let you explain. Yeah, no, no, I, I, you're right um, in that the conflation of the terms is not wrong, but it's also not right, right? And what I mean by that is, is responsibility uh, is sometimes evoked by the person, right? And it's sometimes something that's evoked upon you to a certain extent. Like if you think in, in the context of either a freelancer, a remote worker, or a person who works in an office, like you have responsibilities because you signed up to do that work, right? So at some somewhere along the line, you agreed that there'll be some kind of scope of work that you're doing. Now, where, you know, a good manager comes into play is like, are you getting overwhelmed? (laughs) You know, uh, how much stuff are you being assigned? And then are you a good communicator to say, okay, that was too much, you know, or this was the right amount, or this was not enough work. And that's, that's an entirely different spoke of of the discussion. But the responsibility portion is, is twofold in the case. It's responsibilities you do not control that you just have to do because of social contract, you know, and then there's the responsibilities you do control where you've willingly taken on things beyond that. And I think where the the fault thing comes into play is more about how the, I guess, idea, concept thing comes to fruition, right? So, and I'll I'll, I'll quote a, a book I read, which I don't often read a lot of books, which is probably not a good thing. I'm just, I'm a very slow reader. So I prefer the audio book thing. Yeah. Um, because it takes me forever to get through a, a paper thing. But anyway, so there's a book, um, by Mark Manson called the subtle art of not giving a fuck. Mm -hmm. And there's one line in this book that just consistently like reminds me and helps me respond to scenarios. And it's, it's always like, and I'm paraphrasing, but it says something along the lines of, um, you may not be responsible for what happened, but you are directly responsible for how you respond. Right. So what I mean by that is in, in this context, like if a client we'll take it in a few spokes. So if a client comes to you and goes, we need to move this deadline up immediately, right? Because of X, Y, Z factors, we're going to market sooner, you know, our funding's changing or whatever the the case is, you know, you may not be responsible for that change, but you are responsible in how you react. And that could be in great. We can match the deadline. Here's the, you know, the new rate or here's how it changes or no, or let's find a middle ground or whatever. Like you're responsible for the reaction portion. Yeah. Um, in that realm. Um, same thing comes down from when you're a, a remote worker or a, even an in-house worker. Um, you know, when something comes down the pipe that has to change your scope of work or course of work for the day, for the week, for the month, you know, you may not have a, a choice sometimes in like doing that work or not, but how you respond to it, 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 both to your employer or client is one thing. And then how you respond to it within yourself is another. Right, so responding saying, okay, great, I'll get that done. You know, we'll have to reprioritize or fine, I'll pull a few extra hours, you know, this week uh, each day to get the thing done. Right, that may be, that's the employer side. But the internal side is like, you can either be angry about the situation or you can find a way to take something out of it, right? In that maybe this is a new way to explore capacity, you know, or what yeah. you think you can get done. Or you may figure out there's a new way to get another thing done um, somewhere along those lines. But the idea here is that, the the fault portion i think is an interesting thing because i think we we jump as people not as creatives but we jump to find someone to blame for yeah. whatever the thing or situation when oftentimes it's, it's sometimes it's just part of the gig you know uh but I, I think the the ultimate vein of that is and this is what leads back into the stress portion is like self reflection here is what really can move the needle when it comes to that situation coming around next time you know there you can't always say no right? But you can plan better for next time, right? And you can't always say yes, but you can plan better the next time. 
Um, or even in the moment, having a, like there's a there's an agile framework piece called retrospectives, where you basically at the end of a sprint, um, depending on your cadence of, of work, um, you have a, the group comes together and talks about what went well, what didn't go well, you know, what they could fix, if there's any action items, whatever, basically like a venting session, but productive. And what I try to do, like even with myself, is like have micro retrospectives, you know, when project ends or in the middle of projects to just gauge where I'm at, to make sure either I'm prioritizing, right? Or that I'm still interested in this, you know, or that I haven't gone beyond scope. Because I think that's the hard part is like, as creatives, we always want to provide value right, at some level. Um, whether that becomes stressful or not is, is up to the individual. But you also have to make sure you're not, you know, it's going to sound funky, but adding too much, right? Yeah. Or adding not enough to the point where you're changing what your client manager, whatever gets out of the situation that may be out of the intent of the thing you're making or too much to the point where you're shoehorning yourself into creating expectations that don't exist. Yeah. Right. Well, and I think that there's sort of two things that you hit really hard that I think are, are both great takeaways from that, that little, you know, tangent that I just took you on was, uh, you know, a, this idea of victimhood, right? You mentioned everybody's kind of looking for, for someone to blame or, or whatever, but I think, well, victimhood and sort of empowerment are the two things that I'm thinking of. And I like them because they sort of play together, right? I mean, if you're the victim, you're always looking for that person to blame or always as somebody else, where if you're empowered, you know, to, you know, take control of your situation, again, you know, to, to your point, you can decide how to react to any given situation. And so I like this idea of, you know, victimhood versus empowerment. And so, and, you know, of course, none of us want to be a victim. And so that only leaves us with the alternative of being empowered. And, and I think sometimes, like you mentioned, you know, maybe a job or work or project or whatever gets kind of imposed on you and steers you down a path where maybe now all of a sudden you've taken on more than you can, you can handle or, you know, bit off more than you could chew. But the fact of the matter that you can kind of control it and control, even if it's just on a micro level, even if it's just what you can control within yourself, you've always got some control. And I think it's really important to be empowered. And yeah. so I think that that maybe segues back into your stress discussion a little bit. So, you know, uh, let's maybe kind of circle back to that a little bit. Yeah. Well, I think the, the, a, a nice bridge is, I don't think you get one without the other, right? You can't have victimhood without empowerment. Like it, the situation won't solve itself until you've got both sides of the coin, right. because right. sometimes the victim is you or sometimes it's someone else. And you don't realize that until you are empowered to think critically right? About yeah. what, you, what you're working well, on. And I think, you know, so much of that is like, you know, I mean, a lot of this, especially around stress and anxiety and things like that is self care. Sure. And I think being empowered or feeling comfortable in your own skin to be able to make decisions, you know, is one of those self care things, you know, yeah. feeling empowered and being allowed to tell yourself one thing or another. And I you think, hit on it directly. Yeah. It's that it's adjusting and making action on what you can control, right? Because sometimes scenarios are out of your control. Like my, my stress problem was primarily because I took on too much stuff, right? But then when you get to a point where you've, you've signed yourself up for obligations and by backing out of those obligations, you're actually doing harm to someone else, right? Whether it be a client or a partner you're working with or an employer, you know, you have to then compartmentalize to a certain extent of like, all right, well, what can I get done to get me, get me to the next thing? It's like people say like, when, if you don't like going to the gym, just start by putting your gym clothes on right? Like even if you don't want to go, you'll be in the clothes. Like that's a, ch a choice you can make, which will get you one step closer to getting out the door and going there. Right. Whereas if you, if you sat and stirred of like, well, do I want to go today or do I not want to go? Like you're just going to sit in that circle. So the same thing goes with, with projects and with stress. You know, if, if you're feeling overwhelmed, right. What I like to do is I like to kind of make a list of, of the obligations I have. Um, I'm a very like visual, like tracking, like pen and paper kind of person. So I like to see the, the, the big list of things as granular as I can get them and then start grouping stuff. Like, okay, I can get this done before X, Y, Z time, right? Or these things are related, or I need to do this one before the other one, even though this other thing is looming and feels more daunting and is scary, right? And I know I need to tackle this thing, but I can get these other things done first so I can get on a roll of like checking off to-do list items. Mm -hmm. Now where that gets dangerous in my particular case is I started to like, um, I, I got addicted to that task list. I felt if I could, number one, fill it up with things I can control, that that meant even if I couldn't control the stress, which I could by not overextending myself, you know, I could control the things I was writing down, right? Which then meant I would never stop adding to this to-do list, which meant I was putting off the thing that was stressful that needed to be finished or solved or talked about in lieu of other things, right? So a never-ending to-do list, right? Or... <clears throat> 
that I was tracking and maintaining things that didn't need that granularity. So I was stressing myself out by doing too much minutia, mm -hmm. right? And then I would continually feel that if I would just, if I can control the to-do list, then I'll control the stress. But they're two independent things, right? With respect to how you address them. They're interrelated in that the to-do list becomes stressful thing, right? And the stress yeah. then becomes- Sort of self-perpetuating. Yeah, exactly. But it, it, where you cannot literally control the, the level of stress in your brain, you can control the things that contribute to it increasing or decreasing to an extent. I know we've been talking about, um, even before the call about, you know, there's, when you work by yourself or, or remote, um, there's often a, you know, when do you start? When do you stop? You know, kind mm -hmm. of thing. There's not really a clock in clock out uh, mindset. Like you have in some office spaces where like people start to leave around five, six o'clock, whatever it is, or they arrive at eight, nine o'clock in the morning. So everyone kind of has a semi similar schedule. Like when you're working yeah. from home, like you open the computer, you go and you go until either you don't feel like it anymore. Or if you're very disciplined, you're able to, to have that segmented stuff. But also to your other point about scheduling, when you've got other life things going on, there's a sense of, of sometimes guilt or anxiety of like, well, I took four hours to do this personal thing today, which means I need to come home and work four hours to replace that time. Yeah. Right? And we have to remember that like the, the path to success, quote unquote, and this is going to get very like high level and, and silly, but the path to success is not with hard work exclusively, right? rest, relaxation, and reflection are very important pieces of that puzzle. Because if you don't allow your brain to, to, to relax, right, or to process information in constantly in go mode, number one, it's bad for the literal organ, right? Because you're just running and running and your body's moving at 100% all the time. Yeah. But you're really not giving your, uh, your subconscious a chance to do any critical thinking. You know, I, I call them poop thoughts, but like when you're sitting on the toilet and that random idea comes to mind, it's because you're not in front of a computer, you're not distracting yourself, yeah. Like your brain, your brain has a chance to wander. And that's where like the true, you know, quote unquote creative stuff comes from is when you have a chance to kind of step back, rethink the solution, rethink the problem, rethink your approach. And even, and sometimes that's, you know what, I was on the right track. I can keep going, but that's validation. That's great. And sometimes it's like, Oh, I didn't really think about this other thing. You know, I should try that as opposed to the running gun, like, Oh, submit it. Tuesday's coming along. I move on to the next project. If you can bake in, time to, to, to reflect, to rest, not only for your project work, but like personally, you'll be better off in the long run anyway. Yeah. Well, it's true. I mean, you know, it's like really everything in life, you know, I mean, it's all about balance. It's about finding some sort of in between. It can't be all work, no play. It can't right. be, you know, all personal time and no work time, you know, or no hard work, you know? And uh, so I think it's really important to sort of look at both sides of those coins. And, and even as you talk about sort of your experience, I mean, I'm sure now playing back this experience that drove you to the hospital, like you can go and look at all these things and go, okay, I get it. I had 3,500 things on my list. It was always rotating. It never got done. Or when it got done, it was just time to write the new list. Like, you know, like, I mean, you can probably go back and sort of self-diagnose it a little better now with some, you know, retrospect, but it's uh, clear that it was sort of a, a shifted balance, right? It was all work, no self you know, and well, that's uh, the funny part, like some of that self stuff is hard to determine because you mm -hmm. think like a as a creative, we not only create for fun, but we create for work. Mm -hmm. So, but like we were talking about earlier, your brain doesn't draw the line in between that. I wasn't prioritizing the rest portion. And the weird part is that whether I was making for fun or making for work, the output was always seemingly productivity, right? I was making progress on whatever it was I was going off of. So my, you know, my, my conscious self was like, Oh, cool. I'm being productive. And this is great. Even if I'm tired, I'm productive. Yeah. But like we were talking about earlier, your brain doesn't link destiny, uh, separate the two types of work. So you're running yourself ragged. Yeah. Well, and I don't know if it's the same in your experience. I, my, most of my background is in, in like advertising agency type world and in ad land, like there's, it's almost kind of a badge of honor to be the guy that worked overnight or to be the one who stayed late or to be the one that got, you know, something incredible done in no time. Or, you know, I mean, that's kind of like a, a status symbol among other creatives, you know, and I mean, you know, it's clearly not a healthy thing, but it's funny, like I'm consulting with an advertising agency and I go into their like break room, you know, and now everybody, you know, of course has, has snacks and all kinds of stuff going on. Right. Well, like two thirds of the snacks are like caffeine infused energy bar, you know, blah, 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 you know, and it's like, it's all reinforcing this, you know, stereotype that you must work all night to be effective. And, uh, you know, and I, I imagine this happens at least to some extent in remote work world, but you know, as well, where, you know, you've got deadlines, you've got stuff to accomplish, you know, now I don't know, I, I guess you're really only doing it for yourself in terms of, 
if you, if you kill yourself and work all night, like they're just going to see that you got work done. Like they, you know, they're not actually have going to, you know, seeing you when they left and see you in the morning when they get back to the agency. But, um, you know, but still, I think you could easily slip into this cycle of trying to kind of kill yourself to work too much. Yeah. I think, I think that's, I think you, you identify the two spokes perfectly. There's the perception of speed, right. Of like, if we were working on the same thing, right. Or the same project and I spent t- literally 20 hours on it. I mean, I would hope that I would progress further than if you spent eight hours on it. Right? Let's assume same skill level, same capabilities, et cetera. But what that does is set bad precedent when we go back to number one, a project management standpoint, two requirement standpoint, three capability standpoint, right? That 20 hour stream of work is not a sustainable way to do work. Yeah. Right. So to be able to budget for projects, that's a very toxic thing to be like, oh, if we do uh, 40 hours, we'd be good. And that's like thinking in the, in the context of a week, but that for someone may mean two days. Right. And that's a dangerous trap to fall in. Um, but the other spoke too is like it, what we we're talking about at the, about the turning off portion. Like if you're able to allow time for that critical thinking, you know, you can get more done. You can get done, get work done better. And what's interesting is, is it is a badge of honor. We've got this toxic hustle like mantra that just sits around and, and the, uh, the irony and, and part of my talk is I think creatives are off the, definitely a piece of that puzzle of blame. Um, and what I mean by that is like, well, we're able to talk about this today, right over the, over, you know, a call with, we on a podcast and there will be people listening to this going, Oh, that sounds like me and da, 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 da. And then they'll go to their job the next day and they'll create a social media image or cut a piece of footage that's talking about the crap we're talking about. I mean, you could pull up on Instagram or, or even YouTube, like all this productivity shit, how to hack your time, how to do more with less, you know, yeah. work until they, you know, see it come out. Like all that shit is so <laughs> bad. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's, yeah. I mean, the, the whole like attitude is just, you know, poisonous. I mean, it's toxic to the whole environment, you know, I mean, it really affects workers negatively. So let's circle back then to your story. So you, you're sitting in the hospital, they've told you, man, you're stressing out too much. I mean, where do you go from there? How do you start, how do you start fixing this situation? Yeah. So if we look at, if we think about the monitors I was on, right, I was, I was attached to what's called an uh, electrocardiogram or EKG for short, which basically measures the electrical signals in your, in your body. Um, and, and it was very weird because when I was sitting in the hospital that after, after they did the shock thing and they did the medication and, and the heart rate wouldn't slow down. Um, and as I mentioned before, like I was at the point of like having to email my boss, you know, or my coworkers or Hey, I'm not going to be in when they took the laptop away from me when right? they took my phone and we're like, we need you to just chill, like stop. Like it was only then, and it's very surreal, but it's only then that like the number, like the heart rate reader started to actually go down. You know, and then I was like, mm, that's funny. Maybe it's cause I'm just literally not doing anything. Like maybe it's cause I'm actual relaxing. And then it was like, bing light bulb. Like, maybe this is part of the thing that I wasn't giving my body a chance to do. Right. And I thought by sleeping at night, that was enough. Yeah. Right. Like, Oh, that little bit of rest, whatever that six to eight hours, whatever I was getting was enough rest to, to last me the other, the flip side, the whatever hours left in the day. Like that was okay. Depending on whatever night, you know, yeah. that was there. and that was kind of the, the wake up call of like, maybe, maybe I'm not doing enough of this. Maybe I'm doing this wrong right? And there's study after study that's coming out, I mean, more recently than ever, of like, there's a significant productivity drop off. If you talk about hours per week, once we hit the 45 to 50 range, you know, if you're, a, a, and I'm going to say regular person, a regular person, meaning not like savant to like Elon Musk est sure. like person, a person who works 50 hours a week, give or take, there's a productivity drop. And I mean like a hard cliff, like not like a gradual decline. Like there's a significant drop in your ability to cognitively um, think through problems, right? Which is arguably what creatives in general, it's all problem solving. So there's a thing that, that we've perpetuated, especially with like things like Silicon Valley and the speed of the way all that stuff works and the um, uh, hustle and bustle of the freelance life of like having to find the next client to serve the next one because you're waiting on money to come in from another client, you got to pay the bills and you've got all these other projects launching at once because it was a cool opportunity or dream client comes down the pipe, you know, whatever. There's a, a real um, limit to what our bodies can do. And I don't think as a people in general, we've really ever taken that into consideration because also everyone's experience is different. And instead we doubled down on that and going, oh, well, 
I might not be able to do 80 hour work weeks, but you can, and therefore you should do that. Right. Yeah. Because you can, when realistically you probably shouldn't, <laughs> at least not consistently. <laughs> right. Well, and I think, you know, there's something to that idea too, that, you know, everybody's different, right? Everybody's got a different level of tolerance and things like that. You know, your stress wound you in the hospital, my, my stress might, I don't know, make me overeat, you know, whatever it is, you know, I mean, everybody's going to handle their stuff differently. And so it's funny, this idea, you know, sort of in the industrial revolutions, 40 hour work week and all this kind of stuff. Like, you know, I might be really great for 40 hours and, you know, but maybe you're only good for 30 or maybe so-and-so is good for 50 or, you know, whatever. But like, so there's that hard cliff, but that hard cliff could hit somebody at any time. And so I think it goes back to this idea, you know, again, of self-help and sort of listening to yourself, you know, having some, you know, idea how to work your body. And I think that's where, you know, sort of the beauty of remote work is, is that it can be very flexible. You know, if you need a nap during the afternoon, you can probably work that out. Right. You know, things like that. So I think that, you know, listening to yourself, listening to your body and having some kind of understanding of you as a human being and then trying to build work around that, I think is a, you know, a great way to leverage remote work to maybe reduce some of the stress. Absolutely. And I think you're, I think you're right. It comes down to planning to a certain extent. And it, that, that becomes hard when you think about billing, right? Because I think when we talk about, even at, even at a company like, like I'm, like I'm at, like we build to projects, right? So we can track time and productivity and whatever. But I, I think if we can, as a, as a creative people, we can separate the idea of billing with the monetary aspect of billing and think of like the time of work, not the time it takes to do the thing. Like to give more context, if we're talking about the time it takes to work on a project, right? And you're like, I have basically this week to get this project done. Right? And I know it's going to exert me this much effort and I'm going to charge whatever I'm going to charge. Like, let's take that out of the puzzle. Right. But I know personally that if I work for more than, I'm just giving an example for three hours at a time, I start to like drift off and I go on to, you know, looking at inspiration or I'm doodling or I hit a cliff. Right. If you know yourself and you know your waves of productivity, and especially if you're a freelancer, work that into your workflow. Right. Because you have full control over your schedule. That's a little different for folks that are in an office, right. Where you're sometimes either, you know, you, you can't work for one hour's mess around for two hours. Like it just doesn't work like that. Cause you've right. got people kind of watching and, and, and depending on the workplace, of course, and I don't want to imply that, you know, some are, are more flexible than others. But the idea there is that if you have control over your schedule, leverage what works for you, yeah. you know, and, and that goes tenfold for like working hours. Like there's, when I was doing my freelance, like full-time freelancing, I would reserve a few days a week for like regular business hours. And I would try to schedule all the meetings then. So I wasn't subjecting my clients to like my weird hours. But I know personally that I get like a second wind around 10 30, 11 o'clock. And if I don't go to bed, I'm up all night. Right. Yeah. And oftentimes like that's quiet time. Like nobody's disturbing me. Emails aren't coming in. Slot messages aren't pinging. You no. Know? So it was a good time for me to either explore something new or get some quality, solid few hours of work in. So when I was freelancing, I was able to go, okay, I know that on, I'm just going to make up a day, Thursdays and Fridays, you know, is when people want to have meetings and talk during the day. So those are going to be my regular office hour days. But on Mondays and Tuesdays, I'm going to, you know, sleep in, right? So then I'm going to start my day later, you know, so I can start to leverage what, what works for me you know, in that yeah. respect. And I'll, I'll keep some normal hours. So if there's things I have to do, and maybe Wednesday's my flexible day of like, maybe I do morning, maybe I do night, you know, or maybe I do a little bit of both, but you, you have full control over your, your bandwidth, your schedule. And this gets a little harder if you're a freelancer that has to go in, into an office, right? Sometimes you're doing that, like, um, uh, on a specific project and they want you to come in kind of thing. Sure. Some of that, like I said, is under your control. You can, kind of, you can figure that out, but there's also, the flip side of that where set your own terms, right? It, even, even if it's just for yourself, like yeah. I'm going to, when I get home, not open the computer for a few hours so I can eat lunch, you know, not be distracted by, you know, uh, email while I'm doing that. You know, th there's a, I read another study um, that was saying there's a, there's a direct link between folks who take working lunches every day of the week um, versus who separate, you know, close their computer or, or look at an article or something that's not work, work and depression. Uh, in that if you don't take that break for your brain to stop and you do just ingest sustenance, whether that's around people or not, and you don't give your uh, a chance to take that second, you're actually doing more harm than good. You're not actually getting the benefit from the things you're ingesting at a certain level. 
Well, I think that makes sense, right? I mean, meals and things like that are sort of by their nature supposed to be rest. Like you're supposed to be not focusing on on plowing the field anymore. Now you're focused on eating the sandwich or whatever. Like, I mean, sure. you know, you're taking a minute, you know, even if it is brief, you know, you're taking a minute to disconnect. And so I think, you know, it's common in the freelance world, of course, but I think also in, in just sort of the remote work world, if you're not disciplined, and I think the word that, that I like to use uh, the most is sort of ritual based. If you don't have rituals where you do like you've just described, you know, I stop, I don't open the computer for two or three hours, you know, and it seems a little funny, you know, like if you're sitting and explaining to somebody at coffee, oh yeah, you know, at 11, I turn off the computer and then I walk away. And, you know, I mean, it sounds so, kind of funny talking about it, but I mean, having these rituals in place, like, I mean, for me, like, Every day of the week, whether I'm going into the client's office or not, I get up, I shower, I get ready, I get cleaned up, and I'm done and ready to go to work at like 8 o'clock. Now, I may not actually go anywhere. I might just sit at my computer. But, you know, nonetheless, I've gone through that ritual of getting ready, and that sets me up for doing work. And so I think the same can be said about lunches and breaks and taking time for yourself and all these things. You know, some of it can be, even if it's not regimented, you know, even if it's not every day at 11, just know at some point between eight and five, I'm going to peel out for two hours and go have a long lunch. And I'm going to read a book while I have a sandwich or something. Yeah, mine is uh, mine is uh, croissants and uh, espresso. Yeah. So I'll, I split, I read a book, I have a croissant and espresso. And that's my ritual. <laughs> and so hey, well, that, that's what I have to do, right? Yep. And so, so I guess, you know, to sort of get back to your story, uh, they've got you connected to all these machines, you're rigged up, you've noticed now, you sit, you're sitting here in bed, probably bored because you've lost all this connection. Your fingers are tingling because you don't have a keyboard to tap. And, uh, you know, but you do notice your heart rate's coming down. And so what did you start doing with those thoughts and where did your head start going and how did the rest of this story play out? So it's probably exa exasperated by the fact that I was in a hospital all morning, but I all of a sudden started to feel actually relaxed. Um, now, I probably had that feeling most days when I went to sleep, you know, but it was very surreal having been in that run and gun scenario, not only because I was working that day, but also because I was dealing with all this hospital crap. But for a moment, I had a chance to breathe, right? I was like, okay, I really have nothing to do, nothing to think about. I'm just going to like, not even think about how I'm going to fix this scenario right now. Like, I'm just going to give this a day of just like, try to clear my head, like just really just watch back and even watching mindless television on the on the TV, you know, whatever it was just to try to, to detox myself and detach from, you know, quote unquote, responsibilities right? Or what I was deeming as the things I needed to get done. And then once, once that was over and, and, you know, heart was back stable and, and they were able to kind of do some, some studying, so to speak, like I was under constant moder uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, monitoring. So they were looking at all my numbers. They were, you know, a camera on me, et cetera, to try to see where I was going. They were doing um, an ultrasound on my, on my chest to see if my heart was actually moving in the way it was supposed to. There was no like bulging and stuff like that. So they were constantly coming in to do that. And that became the ritual as I was there. Like I knew they would come in every few hours. So I needed to be able to eat and rest and whatever. And when I got home, it was, it was, I, I felt myself going, all right, I got to get back to work, you know, got to start on that thing. And then I was like, wait, 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 that's what got me here in the first place. Right. I need to take a second. I need to start stripping out some of the stuff that's going on. And so part of the, 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 the system, so to speak, that I tried to evoke was I needed to like, number one, think critically about what was going on, right? I needed to, to ask myself questions that were like, is this the thing I should be doing, right? Is this the thing I need to do right now? Is this important? Is this not important? Who, is, who am I indebted to, so to speak, by taking this project on, you know, or not taking this on or, or taking this obligation at work or whatever it is. And once you're able to kind of figure out the what, right, you can then ask, you know, you know, well, comma, what, right? And that's, you know, chop off the things that are just erroneous to a certain extent, or that are not giving you um, a clear path forward. And this is a lot easier said than done. So I'm not trying to imply that this is an easy process, because this is arguably the hardest thing. Once I had the collected list of things going on, I had to figure out, like, I knew that this was too much, I had to figure out what I can get rid of, or what I can dial back on, or what I can repurpose. And cutting out things you enjoy or obligations you've made are very difficult, especially when it's people you care about or people you enjoy working with, you know, and that kind of thing. So, but you have to realize that something's got to give, and that may mean giving it for a little while, you know, I mean, I mean, permanently, but so I started cutting things out. That meant dialing back um, my involvement in some of the professional orgs. It meant saying no to making plans every night to go out to dinner with friends when I knew I had obligations. It meant setting a cap of like time of like going, all right, I know I have to get this project done and I have five days to do it. I'm not going to work two overnighters. I'm instead going to break it up over a few days, mm -hmm. you know, so I can, I can space out. 
And once, once I got through all like the cutting, so to speak, um, you then have to figure out, well, what can you, what can you double down on and give your attention more? Not only because you have a little more time now, but you can think more critically about this stuff. So it's like an incubation phase. And that came down to like the people that I was working with uh, in a work context that meant spend, who I was spending my personal slash free time with. You know, am I, do I really want to hang out with these people or am I just saying yes to these plans because I feel like I have to, you know, and choosing the right, the right stuff there. And then when it came to like RFPs and, and figuring out, you know, what's coming in uh, next work, like, is this something I'm excited about? It comes back to like, there's a, um, a podcaster and, and designer and lettering artist, Scotty Russell. And one of his uh, kind of things is if it's not a hell yes, it's a hell no. Right. Which is yeah. hard to put in the frame of everything. Right. Especially when you got bills to pay and, and obligations to meet. But you can start to, to realize, like, if this isn't exciting to me, if I'm not actually like, this is going to be cool. You know, even in some vein, like maybe it's I need to refer it to someone else or just flat out say no so that I can incubate the stuff that's 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 interesting to me or that I, that'll get me forward or that I need to do so that you can work better on those things and not spend time on things that are erroneous or uh, uninteresting or whatever. And then kind of the last spoke of that is one, once you've kind of gotten through, and this isn't necessarily linear, it, it, you're kind of all over the place here, sure. um, is you have to kind of learn to just be, be more intentional, right? And what I mean by that is not, not like, oh, I'm going to make that decision and I'm going to go for it. But like asking yourself why, like why, why am I going to add this thing to my plate? Right. What is the intention behind? Where does this get me? And not everything has to get you to the next thing. Like you could just do something for fun. Right. Or because it's relaxing. Like that's okay. But that is the intention. The intention is to relax. It's to have a break. It's to break the monotony. It's to add a new ritual, whatever it is. But it's being intentional. Right. And it's trying to be mindful about all the things in your ecosystem, whether that's people, obligations, you know, work, whatever it is. Um, even like you were talking about your schedule, like being mindful of like, I know I have to go and to this obligation with these people, or I know I need to go into this, this client meeting, or I need to take that time to rest, or I want to have my croissant and coffee in the morning. So it's being intentional about those, those things so that you're not really just running around like a chicken without a head going, I have all these obligations and all these responsibilities and all these people I want to help. And then I want to do all this resting and I just can't yeah. figure out how to do it. Right. And then to your other point about rituals, I think where this all kind of comes together is this is not number one, a prescription, right? This, because it worked for me, doesn't mean it's going to work for you. And to be honest, like it, the system has broken down a few times and I can yeah, always go back and go, well, that's because I, maybe I didn't think hard enough about what I was doing there, or I gave too much time to one thing or the other. But I think we, as a people in general, uh, you know, everyone talks about like the, the, the need or want to do things fast and wanting to see results immediately. And we have to realize that, uh, especially with our bodies, that's not how things work you know, and with rituals, like the, even the term ritual means like repetitive, right? It has to be done over time. So to try a new schedule for one week may lead you some learnings, but to do it for a month, that's much better, right? Let your body get used to the change because you have to think about, and I think this is the hardest thing when you can zoom out a thousand, you know, a thousand feet, you realize like to make an impactful change, you have to then break a habit you've been doing for a long time, right? So if you've been doing this bad habit for 50 weeks, you can't expect your body to change after one week. It's impossible. Yeah. It just doesn't work like that. It's, you know, cause and effect. Well, yeah, it's like yourself, getting in shape, right? Exactly. You give yourself four weeks though, maybe you'll start to see a little bit of results. If you can give six months, even better, you know, or three months, whatever it is. But like, you have to give yourself time. You know, that's why it's always, oh, the people are like, oh, I tried that thing yesterday. It didn't work. It's like, okay, but that's like yesterday. Like, then you yeah, woke no. up today, it's a new day. Yeah, I think that's a huge point, actually. I mean, there's so many people who who do try and, and again, I think it's sort of like what you alluded to earlier. It's it's sort of fueled by the social media rich environment where things just move at the speed of light and there's just no hope of catching up, but you do your damnedest. And, you know, I, I think there's also a little uh, problem, at least in, in the creative space, and I assume this happens in the remote world as well, um, where you kind of get rewarded for some of this too, you know, by way of promotion, by way of a big fat check every now and then, like you forget all those overnighters when you're cashing that check and then you're going out with your buddies, you know? Right. Like, I mean, sometimes we, we're almost setting ourselves up. Like we have to forego this short-term satisfaction and invest in ourselves longer term. And, and I think that that's a, you know, I mean, I've been struggling with my weight my entire life. I've never really got it worked out. I'm still, you know, I go through spurts where things are going all right and then not. And then it's like, you know, I mean, but it's always the struggle. And so, but then I get really upset when, oh, well, I've got, you know, a conference, I've got Creative South in a month. 
And, you know, they, I, I want to be, I want to be looking good and be, you know, in shape by the time I go down there and gorge myself on meats. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to happen. Like there's no yeah. time for that. I very deeply relate to that, but I think the challenge too is like, we have to remember not to compare ourselves, mm -hmm. right? not even to each other, but also to everyone else around. Um, the acknowledgement that everyone else's journey is different and the way they learn and the way they process. Like if you change something for three days, it could be 100% impactful where it might take me three months. Yeah. Right. And social media is part of it, but I think, I really think this is a human problem in that we've had this hustle culture. It's just been called something else for forever. The difference now is like we have social media, so we're able to see it. Yeah. Right. We see it's everyone's hustle culture. Yeah. It's reinforced at a magnanimous scale that we can't even fathom. Data literally moves at the speed of light. You know, where before, I'm going to make up an example, like when, you know, back in the 1900s, you know, it may have, you had to wait for five people to tell you about some guy's hustle, right? Yeah. Where like now it's like, you just scroll on Instagram and you've got 200 people saying, oh, I've been hustling all day, da, 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 da. Yeah. You know? Well, yeah. Or, you know, you had to get a, a letter from the home office to know there's been a change or, you or a know, promotion or to get yeah, fired. Kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's crazy. And so I think, you know, I, I guess again, sort of the moral of this whole story really does come back to self-care. I think the idea of being intentional is really strong. And, and I also think that, you know, it, just in terms of managing your stress, I mean, yeah, if you're not trying to keep up with the Joneses all the time and you're just allowed to be happy with the life you've created, and if you're not happy, go ahead and work on aspects of it and try and solve problems versus just going, oh, well, that 17-year-old chick has a yacht and I don't, you know, because I saw her on Instagram and I'm going to get into my beater V-dub or something to drive to work. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, it, it can be really difficult for, I think, some people more than others. But I mean, it's really difficult to immerse yourself in that kind of thing, you know, viewing it in Instagram or wherever, yeah. and then, you know, get back into your crappy car. Like, you know, yeah, and I, I think the first, what I've started to realize, uh, at least for me, is the first step towards this, aside from that process that I was talking about, is you have to consider um, the way we, the way we vocalize and interact with people. Right. I started to realize that when people are always like, how you doing, man? I'm like, Oh, I'm just busy. You know, I'm just busy doing stuff, hustling through, you know, whatever mm -hmm. bullshit phrase that you, that you put in. And you realize that number one, the conversation always stops there. Right. So no connection between people. We will, what the hell does busy actually mean? Am I doing things that matter or am I just checking off little micro to do list items that don't really do mm -hmm. anything? Right. So what it started to, to, to make me realize is kind of two things. Number one, when people started to ask me that, I would tell them what I'm working on. Like, hey, I'm working on this cool project. Do you want to see it? Oh, no? Okay, no big deal. Or, oh, you know, I'm having a, a rough day and here's why, you know, or whatever. Like giving a little deep, because people are asking. And generally speaking, if they're asking, they probably are, are give a shit about you. So give them a real response, right? But that initial change of like even how I was communicating started to break down the, the busyness, right, of the situation of going, okay, what am I critically thinking through now that I could either uh, benefit from just vocalizing, right, or I can use someone else's perspective on, right, to maybe make me think about something I wasn't thinking through, or to help challenge an idea I had or whatever. And that's kind of vein one. And vein two is like, you start to realize that, that the word hustle is very interesting when you look at its roots. Um, and what I mean by that is like, the word hustle, you know, in the beginning was like, I think in the beginning, but when it became a socially used term often meant like to screw someone over, right? Yeah. To get, to get hustled was not a good thing. Yeah. Right. right. To be a hustler wasn't a badge of honor. Right. Exactly. And we've bastardized the term to become this badge of honor, this positive thing of like, Oh, they're, they're hustling. That's awesome. They're making progress. They're doing work, whatever. But let's take that back a step. Right. And think about the actual word. And I would, I would challenge everyone who says things like, Oh, I'm hustling every day or whatever to really think, are you hustling or are you being hustled? Oh, right? Yeah. Because that's, it's such a weird, like when you step back and you're like, oh yeah, I've been hustling. I've been, you know, working 15 hour days, you know, doing all this shit, da, 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 da. But it's like, but who's pulling the strings? Is it you? Yeah. Is it, if it is great, then you're doing something. You've got maybe some kind of plan or maybe you don't and you got to figure that out. But if someone's pulling those strings and you're putting in, you know, 10 X the effort that, that someone else is or that, or that perceptually is coming down the pipe, you know, are you the one that's being hustled there? Right. And yeah. maybe that's, maybe that's a you thing. Like you've set the bar at like, I can do 80 hour work weeks and therefore the company or person or client is like, okay, well, that's what you want to do. Let's do it. 
right? Yeah. And you set that expectation. So you can't blame them as much. You know, they're, they're at blame for taking advantage, but that's a different. Yeah, different but that thing. goes back to that responsibility part, right? And exactly. Sort of owning what you you yeah. decided that you can do. Sure. So, and it's funny, you know, you make a good point about just sort of, I, I mean, I think that your your example of, you know, what do you say when you say hi to somebody is is sort of indicative of a person's mindset, right? So you're saying, you know, oh, hey, how's it going? You know, I'm hustling. Or I I am totally guilty of, you know, for 20 years saying, oh, I'm, I'm just busy, busy, just cranking, you know, just busy. And uh, I made a conscious shift in that a few years ago uh, to, I mean, you know, trying to be clever or funny or whatever, but I started saying I'm better now, you know, so somebody would walk up to me, hey, man, how's it going? Oh, I'm better now, you know, and that would always get a little smile or something and we'd start talking. Or, you know, I also do one that's, uh, you know, uh, somebody will ask me how I'm going, how it's going. And I'll be like, so good. So good. You know, and it doesn't really matter what's going on, but by framing my day in that way or framing whatever it is I'm on my way to do in that way, it sort of elevates my attitude about everything, you know, and for people, you know, like, like we were discussing who feel isolated and who maybe struggle with some depression, things like that. I mean, little, little hacks like that to sort of elevate your day just tend to keep you a little bit further out of that muck, you know, keep you a little, a little further away from, you know, getting down on yourself in the evening or whatever. Yep. And, uh, you know, sure. so I think it's really Vocalize. important. Yep. Vocalizing either literally to other people or just out loud is a very, um, relieving form of expression. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that's, I'm having a shitty day or I had a really good day, like either way, getting it literally off the chest out of the head is, is a fantastic exercise just to start. Right. And yeah. if you're not the type that wants to like, be, be sitting at a desk going, man, today sucks. <laughs> That's fine. Like I used to journal a lot and I, I realized that um, I was, uh, over time I realized I was only journaling when I was upset, which is really interesting because you go to like read back your thing and it's like, wow, someone just read this. They'd think like I was in a bad <laughs> place for like, a long time. But then you realize like as humans, we number one, tend to remember the negative over the positive. Um, and two, that's often when we're in our most, uh, I'm going to say needy, but I don't mean it in a negative way in our most needy state. Like we need yeah. to do something to solve. Right. So what I tried to do is, is I had a, I had the journal, right. That I would write all my shit in. And then in the back, literally on the back page, I started to write like, uh, and I, so let me rewind, um, on the back page, I put like months down the list and then in the journal itself was just, I would date an entry and then write. So what I started to do is for every like entry that I would do, I would flip to the back and I'd write like a thing I accomplished that day or that month or that week or anytime. Like, like for example, when I got to speak at Creative South, like as soon as I got home, I wrote it under, you know, April got to speak at Creative South because what it does is like when you're skimming through the journal of your brain or the actual journal, you know, you're flipping through like, damn, all this negative stuff. Like I haven't done anything this year. Like it's been all upsetting. And then you said, you're like, wait a minute, what if I just flip it? Right. Let me look at the positive stuff. Even if it's like, I did the dishes four days in a row. Like it doesn't matter how granular it is, but you start to realize there's some success baked into all the potentially bad things you've gone through, even if they're micro wins. Right. Yeah. And then it all leads up to the idea of the law of attraction, right? The more good you put out there, the more you talk to people, to the universe, whatever you believe in um, about the things you want to do, you start to realize that the world around you will kind of mold and help. You know, it, it once, because like even telling you like, Hey, I want to speak at more conferences, right? I want to, I want to tell this story to more people. Like that's how we got connected in the first place. Mm -hmm. We would have never been on this, this podcast today. If we hadn't had a conversation at creative South or you hadn't seen my talk or I hadn't been given that opportunity to get on the stage. And then we hadn't emailed back and forth. And all of that is because I just, I started to try to vocalize the things. And so this comes back to our, you know, Hey man, how's it going? It's like, good. I'm, I'm trying to fix this problem. Right? Or I'm trying to think through uh, a new way to vacuum my floor. You know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. you know, let let the let it out into the ether. And you know what? You may not get anything from it, but I can't tell you how many times. Like, and, and by that I mean someone may not have a solution for you. But there's been plenty of times where I've like been writing an article or something, and I say the word the words I wrote out loud, and I'm like, that sounds funny. You know, when you read it back, and then you're like, oh wait, there's another thing there. Or all of a sudden, your brain picks up on some weird rhyming scheme or another word you didn't think about or an idea, even when you're sketching. You know, you start to look at things from a different frame when you hear it, you see it, you speak to it, like yeah. the way using your senses to your advantage 
creates yeah. new opportunity. For well, it's people. true. I think, you know, sort of subconsciously you're creating focus and creating that focus, I think is what helps. I mean, like I'm not a particularly spiritual guy, but as long as I can remember, I've always told people, you know, anytime, like as a freelancer or whatever, we're struggling for work, we're feast and famine, feast and famine, and we're struggling for a new project. I just kind of say it out loud, just sort of put out into the universe that, you know, we're ready for work. We're, you know, we're looking to take on some stuff and, you know, it may not be tomorrow, but it doesn't take long before things start kind of showing up. And I don't know for sure if it's just attention to detail. Maybe I'm spotting new things. Maybe I, you know, to use your example, maybe I said out loud to somebody, oh yeah, we're looking for some new projects. And maybe they didn't have anything, but they told somebody who told somebody who told somebody and that person emailed me, you know, and you, you just never know how it's going to work. And so, I mean, keeping everything to yourself is just not going to end well. Like you've just got to get it out there. And to your earlier point about, about like, how's your day going kind of thing, like, you are a product of your own mentality, right? So if you are negative out, out loud all the time, now given this, uh, de- depression is a real thing. Like I don't want to make light of anything like that, but, or, or isolationism or anything like that. Like I'm not trying to, I, I don't want to imply that I'm, I'm making light of those kinds of things. But if all you're feeding yourself is toxicity, all you're going to get is toxicity, right? And this is, like I said, outside of the clinical, like there's real brain chemistry there. But like if we're talking about today, like yep. I have had a good day. And before this podcast, I was like, all right, I'm going to get on this podcast and we're going to talk about cool stuff. So immediately I put myself into a brain phase of like, this is going to be a good conversation. Like I didn't come on and be like, fuck, I got to do yeah, this other thing today. Yeah. And then I got to go home and do this. And I got like, I didn't come in upset, right? Yeah. Between the energy, you know, if you believe in energies, like we brought to the table, like was positive on this end, it was positive on your end. And we're here having positive conversation. Yeah. And it's like, you can look at that at a body language perspective. Like if you're walking down the street and someone gives you a dirty look, you don't know what, you know, if it was intended at you or not, but all of a sudden you're like, fuck that guy. Yeah. You know, whether they meant to or not. So if you can try to at least in, and it's important that this is at least somewhat genuine, like don't try to fake it, like be real with yourself. But if you can put out that positive stuff, like I'm looking for work right now and I'm really like a new project, right? You may all of a sudden made hear the word project in your head and all of a sudden start, like you said, see detail, right? Yeah. Or someone hears it you know, and then is it like, oh, there's project work. Or you may just get yourself in a better place mentally to be like, all right, and today I'm going to write two more pitches. You know, it's all about mentality when it comes down to it. And that yeah. trickles back to stress. It trickles back to isolationism. It trickles back to like getting work, having work, being at work, having that separation. It's all down to mentality. Yep. Nope. I think you're right. And I think, you know, it's all the things we've hit on, you know, it's empowerment, it's self-help, it's, you know, it's all these different things, but they all contribute to one greater puzzle. And I think the, you know, the answer is that, you know, none of this will happen overnight. I mean, the, you know, the last time I put out this call for work or whatever, the people who came running were people I've known for 20 years, you know, and it's not that they just came running, but I have a relationship with them. And when I hit them up and said, Hey, I've got a problem, they were looking for opportunities. And, you know, so I mean, it's, it's not something to, to just go flip a coin and go do right. I mean, this is a, a constant state of, you know, engagement and interest and talking to people and developing relationships and all these things. And then it's all there to catch you, you've got the safety net, and you've built relationships that can help you and you've got all these things going for you, that allow you to be more comfortable and more happy and, and eliminate some of those stress. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you just one last quick thing. Um, you know, the, the sort of the focus of this podcast and, and the team made apart network and everything else we're working on is not just to help the employees who I think we've done a lot of work for today, but I also want to think a little bit about the employers. And I, I just wonder if you have anything just from your experience and maybe you don't, uh, just given that you're in and out of working for people and freelance and all this stuff, but do you have any thoughts about how an employer could have been of more service to you or what, what a responsible manager might have done that might have helped keep you from getting to that spot? Sure. Sure. I think the, 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 it's hard to critique people that weren't in the industry. Right. And what I mean by that is when you have a boss that is a little bit separated from the work you're doing, uh, it comes up to the employee at a certain level to explain to said manager what's going on right? Do you have an onus there, that responsibility portion? But on the flip side of that, if you're a manager who's hiring a creative person who is not, and you are not a creative yourself, it is also on you to learn a little bit about number one, that person and two, the work they're doing. And that may be by asking pointed questions. Hey, can you keep track of your time on this project? Because I'd like to know about just generally how long things take. And this isn't a reflection on you. I just want to know so we can plan better. So I don't stress you out. You know, you have to be proactive as an employee and as a manager. Um, 
I can say that at, at Fidelity, it's the first time I've had a project manager and a people manager as two separate individuals. Oftentimes it's the same person mm-hmm. um, or that person doesn't exist at all and you're kind of self-managing, whether that's as a freelancer or as an employee somewhere. Um, but what I like about this, this model, and given it's because the company's enormous, is I have a different focus with each person with regard to the discussion. And the work all intertwines, right? We're always talking about work in some way. Um, but it allows for that opportunity to let your personal stuff kind of bleed into the conversation because ultimately you're bringing yourself to work, right, as an employee. And managers who are good realize that like everyone's a little different, right? And that you, different people need different things. And how the manager can best advocate for those individuals will make the quality of the work um, team times better if that person is comfortable there, if they feel like they, they can be heard. And, and that may not mean like literally their commentary impacting decisions, which would be great, but that's not always the case. But at least that they know they have a panel that they can come and say, look, I need to air this grievance, or I'm really concerned about the direction we're going, or I didn't feel comfortable speaking up in that meeting because of whoever was involved, you know, but I, I'd really like to get this feedback across. And having that person to go to, i.e. the manager, And that manager creating a safe space for that kind of discussion to occur is essential for not only the project or or company's success, but their relationship between the manager and the individual, you know, and then ultimately the individual's performance output as a designer, but also as a person, right? So they don't feel overwhelmed, but then also their work can be better, right? Or they don't spend too much time going off in the wrong direction, whether that's, you know, because they didn't ask the right questions or because the original requirements were blurry, you know, whatever it is. Having a manager that can check in with you regularly and create a culture of openness to a certain extent, uh, I think is essential. And I'm, I'm experiencing that um, uh, most recently uh, in a very new way. And it's been immensely rewarding at number one, changing my mindset about how I come to work every day um, or call in for work or whatever, but also my output. I mean, I'm feeling more, um, uh, more heard more than my decisions and my individual work is fitting into some ecosystem. And that's because they're able to bring back that insight from like the higher ups, so to speak about where this stuff's playing in. Uh, But they're also providing a space where like, if I'm concerned about the work I'm doing, the direction we're going, or um, I had a tiff with another employee or whatever, that I can bring that to them knowing that that won't like be a mark on my record. Like they actually want to hear that feedback in a way that's constructive. Now I'm not saying that like, they're like, yeah, come and bitch and complain to us all day. But like, I try to go with a solution. I'm just that kind of person. So, but I know I can go to these people and feel comfortable doing so um, and not feel, feel fear of like repercussion, which I know a lot of people out there feel. Yeah. I think culturally, um, you know, whether you're doing remote work or you're co-located in office, like, you know, that sort of acceptance or that sort of open door policy, but for reals, not just like pretending that we have this open door and then we actually are are vindictive about things, but having a real life open door, I I think, you know, I mean, it establishes trust. It helps people feel better. It reduces anxiety. I mean, those are all, all positive characteristics. So I think that's a really good, uh, good thing to cap this thing off on. Um, Hey, where can people find out more about you? Where do you want me to, uh, or where do you want to send people to, to learn more about you? Taylor cash down. Sure. So I'm I'm everywhere on social media as Taylor Cashdan, uh, and that's T A Y L O R C A S H D A N. Um, and I believe we'll put a link in the show notes. But I have a, a a link to all the studies and stuff that I've found and collected over time that helps understand the whole stress world. Um, and I like to share that with people for two reasons. Number one, so they know I'm not making this shit up. But two, uh, I think as a people, we're better. We can better address our own things if we understand the world around us. And learning from others is the best way to do that. And that means like, I'm open to like, you find something cool, send it my way. Like, that'd be awesome. You disagreed with something there or something I said, let's talk about it. Like, let's figure it out. So, and that's, that's a link off of my portfolio, but there's a, I'll send you the direct link that way folks can see it. Cool. Um, I do a side project called Black Soul Club, the kind of a coffee occult brand. It's just a little bit of fun. Uh, you can follow that on the, on the socials. Um, but other than that, I'm, I'm, I'm looking into like trying to share this story. So if this seems like a fit for you or your event or whatever, or if you just want to have a conversation one-on-one, like I'm down here to help. Yeah. That's awesome. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Taylor. I really appreciate you. I'm glad we were able to get you here for the, for this thing. Uh, it's a conversation I've wanted to have with you for a long time. So I really appreciate it, man. For sure, man. This is great. Cool. All right. Well, thanks so much. And, uh, we'll see you next time. I don't owe you anything. I don't know you anything.